to stand or sit, but we're going to baptize three more. Good morning, everybody. It is so good to see you all. We're so glad to have you. Welcome, and welcome to anybody who's online who's going to be checking in. We are just happy to have you worshiping the Lord with us today. Just a reminder that next week is um, cookie hour and a business meeting. So just to keep that on your mind, I do like all sorts of different types of cookies. So <laughs> whatever you bring is going to be great. No bake cookies are some of the, my favorite. So, no bake cookies. <laughs> it's hard to beat. But I think that that's about the only thing I needed to at least remind you of. Uh, of s November church work day, um, the fifth of November. Did we? What time? So around 9 o'clock on the 5th of November, we're having a church work day. Please come. We, we got some stuff that really needs to get taken care of here. Yeah, we need some strong guys to help us move a piano out of here. <laughs> so, um, But that is the 5th around 9 o'clock. And also just to kind of let you guys know what's all going on. It's not this next week that's coming, but the 23rd. Ray and I are doing a little switch. He'll be the one preaching, uh, and I'm going to go over to Willamina and take over the pulpit there just for a Sunday. So just so you guys are aware, that's happening at the end of the month. Um, was there anything else I may have missed? No? Okay. Well, if you wouldn't mind, as the praise team starts making their way forward, would you stand? And I'd like to open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the ability just to be here together as the body of Christ to, to worship and praise you in all sorts of ways, Father. We just pray that you would be here with us, that you would open our hearts and our minds and our souls. Father, we just ask that our worship will be a pleasing aroma going up to you. Father, we love you, and we thank you just for this opportunity to be here together to fellowship worship and praise you. In your loving name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So 
Please read with me Acts 8, 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people.
pretty good. That's pretty good. There was a guy named Mark Twain. He was not a Christian. And he watched the Christians, and here's what he decided faith was. <laughs> faith is believing something you know isn't so. That's kind of a sad commentary on the Christians he was watching, isn't it? Okay, let's go with another lie. We are told, without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So faith's pretty important, right? Now, but what is faith? In, in this verse, it looks like you have to believe that God exists, but you have to believe something about him. He's the rewarder of those that seek him. Now, the story was told to me about a boy who liked to ride his bicycle, lickety-split up a path across the, the tarmac. Yes, ma'am? that? Right. Yep, we got faith it's there because we felt it. Well, anyway, this boy liked to ride up the path and across the tarmac, you know, where they parked the cars in front of the garage. And one day, he come home from school, he was about a first grader, and there was a big old post sitting right in the path, right at the edge of that tarmac. And he ran his bike right into it. He didn't like that post. <laughs> and he complained to his mother and said, what's that post doing there? And she said, oh, you'll see. And he said, that post is a real nuisance right in my way. And, well, your father got it there because he thinks you'll like it. Well, I don't think I like it. Well, have faith in your father, because he has plans that you will like. So the boy said, okay, he'd ride his bicycle around the post. Now, what do you suppose that post is for? Next slide. A basketball hoop. So on his birthday, his father finished up that post, and then he and the little boy played basketball together. He had faith in his father because he knew his father cared about him and would do right by him. You have faith in your parents. They care about you, and they're going to do right by you. Now, so sometimes you don't believe things Exactly right. Remember the story of Jonah? How much faith did he have? Not a lot when he started. You know, when he came out of that big old fish, did he have faith then? Then he had a lot of faith. He knew God meant what he said. Right? Next slide. Then there was this guy named Noah. You know, he'd never seen it rain ground was all sub-irrigated. Moisture come up from underneath. So he'd never seen it rain. He'd never seen a flood. And God told him, you better build an ark because there's going to be a flood and there's going to be rain. Kind of imagine what Noah might have thought, might have said, you know, but God, that's a big job. It's going to take years and years to build a boat like that. And God could say, well, Noah, how long can you tread water? You know, it's going to rain. Noah believed God. He had faith because he believed what God said. Okay, next slide. So the simplest thing for you kids to remember, if you want to have a description of faith, faith is believing God Bible, you can find a whole lot of things that God said. Okay, you can go with your Him who died for them. 
everybody. I started doing this presentation. And I realized I'm getting old. <laughs> Why do I say that? A long time ago, 30 years ago to be exact. To me, that's not a long time ago. 30 years is nothing. But for a lot of people, I look out there, they're like, oh, Andy, you're old. But anyway, 30 years ago, in the 1992 Summer Olympics, the hope uh, for the British entry for the 400 meter re, uh, race was a gentleman named Derek Redmond. He was pretty much a guarantee to win. He had been taking all the heats, winning all the victories, and everybody knew he was going to win that gold medal. Unfortunately, in the first semifinal race of the 400 uh, meter, they were off and running, and he was in the lead, and at the 200 meter point, halfway, he tore his right hamstring and collapsed on the field right there. The race continued on because that's what you're supposed to do and Derek struggled mightily to get up on his one foot and began hopping the last 200 meters to complete the race. And out of the stands came one man. He plowed his way through all the people, broke his way through security, ran out, hugged Derek, this was his father, and said, Derek, I'm here, son. We will finish the race together. When they finally approached the end line, the finish line, 50 meters remaining, the whole stadium was standing on their feet, cheering, applauding, screaming, well done. I think this is a perfect example of one of the many traits God has given us, that as humans, we admire, we encourage the underdog to overcome defeat. And right now, this simple observance that we're about ready to partake of is recreates and retells the greatest story of triumph over defeat. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we read, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. As we take the bread, we need to remember that the broken body of our Lord, we are proclaiming that when we fall on the track, when we collapse, that the very Son of God stood and rushed to our side. As we drink the wine, the juice, it represents the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. We are showing the world that what we could not do by ourselves is now within our grasp through Jesus Christ. Jesus with his arms around us is saying, I'm here. We'll finish the race together. And we can know with certainty that the stadium of heaven is on its feet cheering and is shouting as we race towards the finish. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for loving us, for caring for us, for your presence in our lives, Lord, that there was no way we could complete this race alone. But because of your love, your love for us, we can complete this race. And because of your victory over death, we can look forward to eternity with you in heaven. We thank you, Lord. In Christ's name I pray.
morning. Well, if you're here for Sunday school, Andrew gave me a good start off for what I'm going to continue to talk about what he was talking about, but from a different gospel. And if you notice, it's called Connected to Jesus. One of the most important things we can come to understand about our walk with the Lord, our relationship with the Lord, and our faith. And before we get started, I just ask, would you bow for a word of prayer with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to hear from your word today. Father, I just pray that you would open our hearts, our mind, and our souls, that you would transform us in some way, help us to grow closer, either in our understanding of you or our relationship with you and what we need to know about just how important you are for our lives, Father. We just pray and just ask that you would be with us. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So I came across this from an unknown source, this story that spoke about strawberries. The, the source goes on to explain that I just love strawberry plants. For once they preached a powerful sermon to me, which I have never forgotten. See, the source goes on to say, I was on my hands and knees in my garden pulling weeds when suddenly I noticed something that I've seen hundreds of times before but never caught the lesson. It was the runners on the berries. See, from the main vine, a number of slender shoots extend like arms in all directions. They are thin green stems creeping along the ground, being pushed out by a mysterious power in the mother plant. After reaching about six inches, the, the end penetrates the ground and develops roots. Then the leaves of the new baby plant shoot upwards. All the while, before the infant plant is able to sustain itself, it receives nourishment from the parent through the runner. When the, the new growth is fixed to the ground, the runner resumes its journey and reaches out another six inches, still nourished by the original clump of berries. Then the process is repeated, and while one plant is multiplying, there are several others doing the same thing in different directions. I forgot all about the weeds, he said, and saw only the mother plant sending out its runners. This caused me to cry out, Oh God, make me like those strawberries, reaching out in an effort to multiply and bring forth fruit. See, today we're going to be focusing on this concept of how the vine is our source of true life, in which we will be diving into a little bit of where do our loyalties lie, especially our loyalties within this world, specifically with regards to, to Jesus and the importance of remaining in Christ himself. You see, Jesus is the vine in which we get all of our life. Without Christ, we will not be able to produce good fruit. We will not be able to please the Lord, and we will not be able to grow and mature as we live out our lives in this world, in which today, specifically, we will be focusing on the very important lesson from Jesus in which we will be reminded that we need to keep our loyalties rooted in Jesus, who is the only source of true life. So will you please turn with me to John chapter 15. We're going to be starting in verse 1. It's John chapter 15, starting in verse 1. And it says, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. Let's just stop right there. Because right there we find our first key point that we can draw from our Lord and his teaching, which is that only through Jesus can we truly be fruitful. 
So starting off, we see that Jesus is taking this concept of a vineyard and, and making a metaphor out of it in order to teach a powerful truth regarding the importance of spirituality. He is teaching us that, that staying connected to our one and only true source of life, which of course is Jesus himself, is, is crucial for the believer's life. This is no new method of teaching coming from Jesus. In fact, he loved using metaphors and powerful imagery in order to help his audience and disciples truly learn and grow in their understanding regarding things pertaining to the Lord. We see right at the start of this lesson, Jesus refers to himself in verse 1 as the true vine, which is Jesus' way of declaring that, that he himself has now taken the place of Israel as God's true planting. You see, all throughout the Old Testament, when it would talk about a vine, it was referring to Israel as a nation as a whole. Every single time, it, they were God's vineyard, they were God's vine, meant to, 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 to go forth and, and produce good fruit for the Lord in the world. And now Jesus has make a, made a declaration that it's he who is the true vine. It's no longer Israel, meaning Israel no longer is the place to go in order to interact with and encounter the refreshing spirit of God. Instead, it is Jesus who has now become the true source of spiritual life that God has now made available for all who will come and abide in Christ. So within God's vineyard, we see that there is only one vine now. And it's crucial not only for Israel, but us all as well, to search out and see if we are truly attached to the one vine, which of course is Jesus. You see, Jesus is breaking down barriers with what he is teaching here. It's no longer just about Israel. All who abide in him are welcome to be a part of the vine. In which through him and him alone, we are to draw our nutrients. Likewise, we today, both men and women alike, are to be doing that. We are to be connected to the vine. You see, our Heavenly Father is the gardener in which he takes care of the vine and its branches. However, with this concept, we also see that just like any good gardener does, God is also prepared to prune the branches that are producing fruit. This is how God is helping us to be even more fruitful within the world. But what does it mean that we are being pruned by the Lord? Well, through our trials, through our hardships, as we continually cling to Jesus, and as we trust in the power of the Lord to carry us through, we are in fact being molded and pruned to be able to not only endure more, but to bring forth more good works for the Lord. You see, bearing fruit is not a test to show that someone is in Christ or not. Instead, bearing fruit is the byproduct that flows from us as we continue to cling to and be nourished by Christ. As he supplies us with nourishment, it flows through us. And as a result, we begin bearing fruit because of the work Jesus is doing within us. This is the exact same concept of what it means to mirror Christ within the world. The more connected and immersed we are to Jesus, his word and his spirit, the more his light will shine out from us. And the more we allow God to prune us and the more we will then grow and the more we will be able to produce for his glory and for the benefit of the world and the people around us so that they can come to know the true vine. However, with this concept comes a warning meaning anyone who is partaking of the nourishment of Christ, any of the branches that are not allowing Jesus to produce fruit through them, well, as John tells us in this chapter a little further on, they will be removed by God, the Father, and reserved for destruction. That's what you do when you have a vineyard. 
a branch isn't producing, you chop it off so that the other branches can get the, the fruit and the nourishment so that they can produce more and more. It's so that other branches can flourish. And it's for God's glory. You see, it's only through Jesus that we can truly be fruitful. So, so if we're not growing and flourishing through the power of Christ in our lives, well, then we need to take a moment in order to check and see if we are truly even connected to him in the first place, right? Because outside of Jesus, we're just withering branches waiting to be cast into the fire. Today in the World once explained how B.M. Landerville has written, the vine clings to the oak during the fiercest of storms. Although the violence of nature may uproot the oak, twinging tendrils still cling to it. If the vine is on the side opposite the wind, the great oak is its protection. If it's on the exposed side, the tempest only presses closer and makes it move closer down to the trunk. In some of the storms of life, God intervenes and shelters us, while in others, he allows us to be exposed so that we will be pressed more closely to him. The question is, are you allowing God to do whatever he deems necessary to prune you so that you can be drawn closer to him and become more fruitful? Or when the pruning comes, do we choose to turn tail and run, not willing to abide because we fear the change he may be calling us to embrace for his glory? See, we as people, we really struggle with the pruning process because it's not always fun, but it's for our good and so that we can continue to produce more for God's glory. We really got to evaluate, do we run when pruning comes or do we embrace it? Only through Jesus are we able to continue to abide and flourish. Only through Jesus are we supplied with his nourishing power. So it is crucial that we come and we really evaluate our lives and keep our loyalties rooted in Jesus, who is the only source of true life. Continuing on, we come to the second section of Scripture for today. Picking right back up in verse 5, it reads, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. We stop right there, we come to see the second key point is that, that Jesus gives us, that he really is trying to concretely get our hearts to wrap around is that only in Jesus can all your needs be supplied. Jesus continues with this metaphor by repeating for us the fact that, that he is the vine and we are the branches. How often do we think that we're the vine? We got to evaluate that. He's the vine, we're the branches. He then transitions into the, this next concept that, that we need to come to understand. You see, learning to abide in the Lord is the most important thing we as Christians can do. Learning to abide. But what does this mean? Well, the word abide is defined as remaining in, staying in, or residing in something specifically here that something we are to abide in is jesus himself meaning we are to be proactive in our faith and connection in the lord it doesn't mean doing nothing regardless of what this world throws at us we as followers of the lord are called to remain in him and him alone we are not supposed to wander off and get swept away by the lusts of the world. Instead, we are to stay connected to Jesus and reside in his goodness and transforming power. 
You see, the fact is that only in Jesus can all your needs be supplied. Nothing else will be able to do this. That is why we see him remind us in verse 5 that, that he who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. He's not pulling any punches here. There is only one way to be supplied. There is only one way to flourish, and that is in Jesus himself. Otherwise, you can do nothing. When Jesus is not in the picture, we are helpless to the sins of the world. When Jesus is not in the picture, we are unable to produce any form of righteousness because of our, our fallen state. It is only through Jesus and his transforming and nourishing power that we are able to truly live. Without him, we are lost. Without him, we are nothing. Without him, we are, as verse 6 explains, reserved to be thrown away and burned as worthless, dead, and dried up branches. That's without Jesus, that's what we're reserved for. Without Jesus, we're completely and utterly hopeless. You see, this is so important for us to come to grips with. Jesus, at this moment in time, felt it necessary to teach us that it is only in him that all of our needs can truly be supplied. Think about what he's about to go and endure. And this is what he thinks is so crucial for us to learn in which outside of him we can do nothing of eternal kingdom significance for ourselves. You see, without Jesus, yes, we might live for the moment. But in him we live forever to bring honor and glory to the Father. And so here we learn that our actions and our choices have eternal consequences connected to them. We can either choose to abide in Jesus, who will lovingly supply us for all of our spiritual needs, or we can choose to depart from him and be reserved for judgment without the protection of our Savior by our side. So what choice will you make? Abiding seems to be pretty important. Will you choose life, or will you choose to be swept away in the fire? You see, what Jesus is calling us to do here is not that difficult to do. He simply asks us to abide in him. Whatever the world may throw at us, we are to be unwavering and firmly connected to the vine. He is the vine, we are the branches. As long as we keep our faith in him, there is nothing in this world that can stand in our way. In Jesus, we have the very source of life flowing through us. Andrew was hitting on this in Sunday school, and, and that can't be missed. Do you, have you really stopped and thought about what it means to have the Holy Spirit living within you? That should blow our minds when we stop and really think about that. God is living with inside of us. He is the source of where we get our very life. And he is living with us. We are never alone. He is supplying everything that we need. And with that comes blessing upon blessing. Doesn't mean that life's just going to be easy but we can make it through because Jesus is with us. For as Jesus reminds us in verse 7, if we are willing to abide in him and allow his words to abide in us, well then, when we pray to the Lord, when we seek him out and, and present our needs to him according to his word and his will, we are promised by Jesus himself that he will in fact supply what we need. I like the way Gregory Berg explains in his commentary when he says, those, who live, those whose lives are so in harmony with Jesus will find their prayers controlled by his word, and such prayers will be answered and bring added glory to God. When we pray for the right things, because we're so connected to the source, the, the vine, that all we can do is think, like him 
and what he would have us be praying for. Our Daily Bread once explained that missionary statesman Hudson Taylor had com complete trust in God's faithfulness. In his journal, he wrote, Our Heavenly Father is a very experienced one. He knows very well that his children wake up with a good appetite every morning. He sustained three million Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years. He goes on to say, We do not expect that he will send three million missionaries to China. But if he did, he would have ample means to sustain them all. Depend on it. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. Only in Jesus can all your needs be supplied, and only by abiding in him are we blessed with his provision for our lives. See, I like that last little statement that God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supplies. How often do we try to do God's work our way? And then we get angry at him because it's not working. Well, again, it's because we're trying to be the vine at that moment. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. Continuing on, we come to the final section of scripture for today. So picking up in verse 8, it says, My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This is my command, or this I command you, that you love one another. See, the final key point that we can learn from our Lord and Savior is that only in Jesus are we able to truly love as God loves. Jesus goes on in verse 8 to explain that God the Father is in fact glorified as we abide within Christ. In which we grow deeper in our relationship with Jesus. As, as we allow his life to flow through us, we will in fact bear much fruit and, and prove to truly be Jesus' disciples. But what is the, the actual fruit that's being produced as we glorify God by abiding in Christ? Well, as our relationship grows deeper, as we allow every ounce of Jesus and his nature to flow within us and through us, what we are really doing is stepping into a relationship of love with Christ, our Heavenly Father, in which real transformation takes place and true fruit is produced and flowing out from us. Basically, as we cling to the vine, which again is Jesus, we are now able to truly love as God loves. Again, this should blow our mind. The love God has every time when we take communion, we're to remember that great love. Can you imagine being able to love like God loves? In Jesus, we can. That's why in verse 9, we see Jesus summing up his teaching all around love. Love is the greatest fruit of the Spirit that we can achieve. You often hear so many within the Christian family that they get all bent up on which spiritual gifts they got. 
Paul sums it up pretty clearly. It's love. That's more important. Jesus makes it clear here in this analogy that he's talking about. Love. You see, Jesus is the very definition of love. And he went to the cross for the sake of all mankind to die in our place. And as he rose again in glorious victory over all of our sin, all death, we saw his love being poured out for all the world. Jesus gave his all for us. And now because of that renewed relationship is now possible for us to have through him. We who choose to come to Jesus, we who choose to abide in Jesus are now being molded and shaped by God to display and pour out his love towards others. Remember the very beginning about the strawberry plant? That's what we're supposed to do. Only in Jesus are we able to truly love as God loves. And as we love with the same love that God poured out for us, God is able to reach the lost, encourage the church, strengthen our relationships, not only with him, but with each other as well. Love is to be at the very heart of not only your life, but the church as a whole. So it's not just me loving you, you loving me, we're to be loving each other. perfect harmony that's what the lord's hoping one day we will come to fully be able to have as we learn to let him prune us and change us and help us to love but you might be asking why well it's simple because god is love and we as his children are to be mirrors of that love in this world that's the fact why do we have to love well because God is love and we are to mirror him but it is only in Jesus that we are able to truly love as God loves Jesus reaffirms this point in verses 10 through 17 so how do we know that we are abiding in the love of Christ well as Jesus tells us it's by keeping his commandments just as he also keeps the commandments of his father in doing this, we will then be a people of God, a holy priesthood that is filled with the joy of Christ and, and fully connected and filled to the brim. So I ask us all today to truly ponder this question. How well are you at loving like Christ? How well are you at loving like Christ. See, this one ran me through the roller coaster this week, thinking about this, pondering. And guess what? I wasn't doing a very good job of loving like Christ. Are you displaying the love of Christ out towards each other as well as those within the world? I'll be the first to say when I get behind the wheel, my love, like Christ, seems to go out the window for the rest of the world. Can any of you relate? If you say you can't, I think there might be some lies and some repentance that needs to take place here. See, I, I joke at this, but it is a crucial thought process. It's a crucial question to ask how well are you at loving like Christ? And we need to ask that daily. Allow the Lord to prune us. Because it was in John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35, 
that Jesus gave us a new command that is to be rooted at the center of our hearts as his people. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The love of Christ is to be at the center of our lives, and the way we love others in this world is what defines us as disciples of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's pretty easy to start figuring out who's his disciple when you start looking at how well we love. So I encourage us all to evaluate our hearts today. If you find that you are lacking in love, then repent and come back to Christ and be reattached to him as the true vine. He's all about grafting us in. We need to be willing to repent. We need to be willing to submit to him, come back to him, and let him graft us back in as the true vine. Allow him to provide you with the ability to love others as he loves us. For this is a new commandment given by Jesus himself that we are to be a people defined by how we love. Only in Jesus are we able to truly love. It's all possible because he first loved us. S.D. Gordon tells of a spring storm that broke a large limb on his cherry tree. Although it hung by a very slender strand, to his surprise, the blossoms came anyway. Later, some fruit began to grow as it did on the other branches. He noticed, however, that only those in full contact with the tree bore much fruit. While the partially severed branch produced only a scanty little supply. See, as believers, we must be careful about our spiritual connections. Make sure we are fully abiding in Christ. The fruit we bear, whether much or a little, tells the story. So today I encourage you to never stop abiding in the Lord and to keep your loyalties rooted in Jesus, who is our only true source of life. Will you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, and it's so important what you presented for us, Jesus, with this metaphor of a vine, us being the branches that are attached. Father, it shows us just how much you truly do love us, that you would not pull any punches, but be right up front about what you're asking us to do where our source of life comes from, how we are to be acting and the types of fruit we are to bear. Father, I pray that you will help us to be a people who love like you. Help us to be attached to you, the one true vine. Help us to abide. And help us bear much, much fruit so that this world will know that you are God, that they need to be attached to you as the one true vine, and so that you will be glorified, Father. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So at this time, I'm going to ask if the praise team will start making their way forward, and I get to offer an invitation, and this one is really important. If you happen to be here and you, you are not attached to the one true vine, and you're ready to be grafted in. There's no better time than right now to make that decision. You can come forward while we're singing this song. I'd love to talk with you. I'd, you could talk with any of the elders. We want to, as the body of Christ, be a part of that grafting into the vine. However, if you have found that you might be half broken from the vine or straying and you need to be grafted in because you're not abiding, you don't need to come up forward to make the, that decision. I, I made it very clear that all you got to do is repent and allow Christ to be at the center. You can make that decision right where you stand. And I encourage you, if you have to make that today, make that decision. And remember always, this is a very safe place.
this is the place to be open and vulnerable and make those decisions. Nobody's going to judge you. In fact, as I was just saying, our job is to love you. So will you please stand as we sing this song? may all be seated. We have some trivia. How did Jesus describe himself in John 15? He's the vine. He's the true vine. What would be done to the branch that does not bear fruit? Yep, I'm pretty sure it would be taken away. We could throw all of those statements in there, so... How do we abide in Jesus' love? Oh, come on. By keeping his commandments. And what was his commandment? How does one become Jesus' friend? I didn't actually fully address this specific thing. By doing what he tells you to do. And what's great about that is he says, no longer are you slaves. You are now my friends because we know what to be doing. No no prayers back there? Perfect. Um, I do have one that uh, Ashton had texted me. Crystal, you guys may remember we did the baby um, shower for her. She shared this this morning that she is doing well and is resting as much as possible. Um, So she's at home. Um, She asks, please pray for a continued healthy pregnancy. So I know she was a little worried there for a while. So she's at home. And so just prayer that her pregnancy will continue to go well. Yes. Okay, praise that Sam and Travis's family, they went through the hurricane and not much damage. And praise that Sam's back, right? He's not feeling very good, but he's back. (laughs) So prayers for Sam also and and healing. Was there anything back there? Uh, Kyle and Kayla are both in the hospital. So pray that they pass through the hospital. And that's Kyle? Kyle? Okay. We need to be praying. Okay. 
So we're okay. Okay. Wow. And that's B the Blair family. Blair. Okay. And and uh, Bob Siegel had a stroke. Bob on Siegel. Thursday. I don't know what that is. But. Okay, so prayers for Bob, who has had a stroke. Who? Don Bennett. Don Bennett. Okay, Don Bennett passed away as well. So, because I didn't write down all of these names, we all heard them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray there seems to be a lot of grief that people are going to be dealing with, a lot of death. I pray for each and every one of those families that was mentioned, Father, that your hands would be wrapped around them, that they would turn to you, the true vine, and find everything that they need in this time of struggle. I do pray that you would provide for them, Father, that your loving comfort would just wrap your, around them and bring them through this time. Grief is never an easy thing to go through. I also just pray, Father, for those who are mentioned that are struggling with their health. Lord, you are the great healer, the great physician. So we just ask that you will have your healing hands wrapped around them, that you would help them to heal quickly, that you would remind them that you are the one who is in control, and that they need to just trust in you, Father. Just pray that you would walk them through it and I do just praise you father um, not only for Sam and Travis's family that was um, in the middle of the hurricane but just for all those who are in Florida it could have been a whole lot worse than it was and I know there was still a lot of damage but you are a good father remind them that you are in control as well and just thank you so much for keeping your watchful eyes upon them when such a disaster go, comes through an area like that. Father, we just love you and we praise you and thank you so much for everything you have given to us. We give you all the glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, will you please stand as we sing this final song?